Hello and welcome to the Ori Spotlight Podcast. This is your host, Jason Foster. Today we are lucky to be joined by Sanjay Srivastava, who is the Managing Director for Accenture's Cell and Gene Therapy Practice. Welcome, Sanjay. Thank you, Jason, for having me here today. Appreciate it. You were telling me that you've been on uh, three or four different continents this week, so we, we greatly appreciate your uh, <laughs> you joining us. Where all have you been been this week? I was in India, uh, actually celebrating Diwali with family. Came back, and then I went to California in San Diego for Bio Manufacturing World Summit. Mm-hmm. It's as you know, is the one of the major conferences for uh, manufacturing for advanced therapies, and then. On Thursday, I was in Dallas for a client workshop, all day workshop. And then on Friday, and your home base is in New York, so you've got all your bases covered. Yeah. Well, thanks again <laughs> uh, for spending some time with us today. And I was hoping we could start out just by finding out a little bit more about what you do um, at the Cell and Gene Therapy Practice at Accenture and also about your career leading up to that. I know for a period of time you led the advanced therapies practice at Deloitte as well. And we'd love to hear more about your career progression that got you to where you are today. Yes, uh, that's correct, uh, uh, Jason. But it all started, I'm an uh, academic by training. So I left academia about 20 years ago and into, came into consulting. Initially, the focus was very wide, but it all changed in the mid-2010s when we were seeing immunotherapies and autologous cell therapies being developed in late-stage development. Mm-hmm. And I led a number of programs for a client to successfully launch first-in-class CAR-T in the U.S. market. And at that time, I was able to complete the full circle from science to management consulting to launch a very complex therapeutics. Started the practice at Deloitte uh, that we were calling NextGen. Uh, knowing the science and then believing in it, we started the work. And uh, since then, I've been doing just cell and gene therapies, uh, quite exclusively for now more than 10 years, perhaps one of the longest uh, serving management consultant in the in the industry. Awesome. And you've seen the whole life cycle from development to launch and now post-launch Correct. for five or six years, right? We've had uh, commercialized at least CAR-T therapies. We've had gene therapies for longer than that. Mm-hmm. That's and what? Correct. tell me a little bit about Accenture's role. Most of us, I think, know Accenture is more of a technology focused consultancy. Um, love to hear more about the kind of work that you're doing in the in the that you and your team are doing in the CGT space. Our brand presence is primarily in technology and uh, digital solutions. Mm-hmm. Having said that, Accenture is a full fledged management consultancy and we do have uh, Accenture strategy and consulting arm that uh, that also uh, we we support our clients. So when I came to Accenture four years ago one of the intent for me was to leverage both the technology powerhouse of Accenture, but also use our Accenture strategy arm to bring business advisory services to our clients. Mm-hmm. And that's primarily because, as you know, cell and gene therapy and advanced therapies is fairly young industry. And a lot of our clients not only need technical solutions, but they also need advisory services. And as a result, the way we stood up uh, cell and gene therapy practice at Accenture was to do both, to do business advisory as well as technical solutions. And I hired several consultants from industry uh, to augment our current Accenture strategy uh, resources that we had at our disposal to augment uh, the overall bench to serve our clients. So give me a little bit. You you and I met, I think you were doing... um a technology landscaping project for a particular client, but can you give us a little bit more flavor of the types of things you get involved in for, I'm assuming mostly therapy developers, you know, pharma companies, biotech companies, but I think you also work for service providers like CDMOs and others. It'd be interesting just to understand a little bit of the areas in which you, in which you specifically focus. As I was saying, Accenture being a full-fledged consultancy, we work across the value chain of the drug delivery. Uh, right from the uh, drug development, early research, all the way to now, as you earlier mentioned, post-launch, even uh, lifecycle management for, uh, for CAR-Ts. And yes, 
Predominantly, our work is with life sciences companies, big and small, the biotechs, as well as the biopharma, but we also work with uh, CDMOs as well as wholesale distributors. We've also done uh, work for them. As, as, as this therapeutic area requires an ecosystem play, not just the innovators trying to develop and commercialize, but also wholesale distributors, they have a role to play and so does uh, CDMOs. And um, we also engage with uh, the providers, the HCPs, um, because they are the key stakeholders from an end user trying to orchestrate the complex journeys. And the type of work that uh, we have been doing has been mainly in supply chain manufacturing, that's the bulk of our revenue, as well as commercial readiness and post-commercial launch. And supply chain and distribution uh, and manufacturing covers not only life sciences, but also the CDMO work that we've done to support the manufacturing and distribution of uh, the complex therapeutics. Is there a common thread maybe over the last several years that you've been hearing from from your clients or the you know common challenges? I'm sure they're well known within in, in within the industry, the types of things that you're <laughs> looking at and evaluating? I think yes, there are myriads of problems that we that, that uh, industry faces. But then one that really pops up and bubbles to the top every time again and again is challenges in manufacturing. Ability to, for the, uh, our clients to scale, to make the product in an efficient manner that can allow for the business to be viable, frankly. And that's one problem that uh, just about every client that we work with have, have, have come up and asked us uh, some support. Whether you are early developer in early stages or you happen to be now post-launch and trying to scale as the asset is moving upstream in the formulary and the patient volumes are increasing. But at launch, the the operations were not designed for the large volume of patients. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we've just um, jointly authored a an article recently that was published in Cell and Gene really about the, you know, we entitled it The New Economics of Cell and Gene Therapy. And I'm, I'm curious uh, from that, discussion that you and I had and the work that you've been doing with clients, what is the, you know, these aren't new challenges. These are challenges that the industry has been facing, you know, since I think these types of personalized medicines were, were conceived. Where have we gotten to? You know, and I think, you know, I've only been involved in, in the cell and gene therapy industry for the last four or five years, but it seems as though these conversations have been, have been continuous since then, this idea of how do we mass produce personalized medicines and gain some of those economies of scale that we've come to expect from the biologics or small molecule markets. You know, what is it specifically that is holding us back from really achieving, you know, large or, you know, greater accessibility for these therapies? I mean, we just saw an incredible, you know, a, a first for the industry with a CRISPR edited product, you know, Vertex and CRISPR Therapeutics just got an approval in the UK that they're expecting uh, an approval later on this year in the U.S., the industry continues to march forward. We continue to bring incredibly innovative medicines to market. But this, you know, you mentioned a commercial viability question is how do we get them to patients? How do we make them affordable? How do we make them accessible? Seems to persist. And I wonder your kind of thoughts on what's holding us back from achieving some of those things. One of the things that we both, Jason, you uh, uh, appreciate is that the current healthcare system both from a uh, receiving end, from the healthcare delivery, but also from a development perspective was designed not for these advanced therapies. It was really designed for treating symptoms and treating uh, you know, chronic diseases over a period of time where the unit cost of the therapeutics was distributed over the lifetime of the patient. Right. What is happening now is that we have a modality that is potentially curative the therapeutics are just very, very innovative and transforming the patient lives. But that is causing is what is called the heavy concentration of the upfront cost to the healthcare mm-hmm. system. Uh, and as a result, manufacturers who are developing have a huge sense of uncertainty on the pricing and reimbursement. Because of that uncertainty, they tend to defer some of the critical decisions that need to be made in order to be successful in a commercial stage 
One, to manage the patient volume, the anticipated patient demand. And two, also from a costing and a pricing of the drugs is a concern. Because when you go and defer the decisions uh, to a later stage or even post-launch, you're trying to perfect a process that was you know, quite uh, tenuous, uh, you know, shaky at best. These mm-hmm. are the paper processes that you take to commercial that are not able to scale because some of the critical decisions around network strategy, around capacity planning, and the technology that you're going to use to do your um, commercial scale manufacturing isn't there. Mm-hmm. And so you end up with a situation where the therapeutics are, uh, one, you cannot make them at scale, and two, they are very, very expensive to make. And that causes, um, it's a double-edged sword for the uh, healthcare system in general, whether it's the payers as well as for the providers, because providers have the same challenge. And when the therapeutics are so expensive, they are uh, burdened by the cost of delivery and the reimbursement challenges. So that impedes even their ability to sometimes onboard the therapies, even if they were ready to, even if they had the capabilities, they they need to look at at whether uh, they would be paid for, let alone the pairs who do not have the longitudinal data in to support the the expense of these therapeutics upfront, which which is very different from what the system is used to and thus far, where you're able to spread out the unit cost of the therapeutics over years. I mean, as we note that there have been many approved products that launch and then unfortunately are removed from the market because of usually commercial issues, not they're not clinical issues. So I think we we noted seven out of 25 approved gene therapies have been removed from the market in Europe for commercial reasons. We're seeing more of that potentially happening in the U.S. as we move forward, which has traditionally had greater ability to pay or willingness to pay. Um, so do you think it's actually that this the standard market access recipe that, that we've been using for many years around biologics and small molecules, is, is it just not fit for purpose? What is it about that model that isn't working? I mean, we're sort of applying the old thinking to that we've what we've always done to advance therapies. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be working. So you talked about, you know, our manufacturing, our inability to even throughput the number of doses we need. We talked about very high cost of goods. Are there other things? I mean, what's, what are the, all the ingredients that are going into this very complicated puzzle, uh, right now? You know, is it just that the model, the old model is not working any longer? Yeah. No, I think, uh, you're right. Uh, I don't think the new, the current model is working. The model has to change. But I think that's nothing new for the industry to know and understand. But but we also have to appreciate the ther- therapies that have thus far come to the market have been for rare diseases, for very ultra rare populations. So the business case and, and the viability of the business is hinging upon, you know, on a very expensive therapeutic for a very small patient volume. Yes. But the investment required to make what we were talking about, supply chain and manufacturing and the process development requires in an ordinate amount of resources. But at the end, uh, we don't have enough patient vol- uh, volume to compensate and to recoup a lot of the, invest- uh, the investments. Mm-hmm. As a result, you know, they, um, you know, companies are not able to invest as much earlier on. And when they see, when they go down uh, with the with the pricing and market access, they see when they come up with um, very expensive therapeutics with a low patient volume, the business model is just not viable, neither for the manufacturers or for the payers uh, uh, reimbursement purposes, because they just don't have enough data to justify uh, the reimbursing very, very expensive therapeutics. Mm. But I think we, we this is going to change. And I believe this is going to change because for two reasons. One, we are now moving into other therapeutic areas where patient volumes are increasing. The indications where uh, cell and gene therapies are being developed are going to be for sometimes even for chronic diseases or or like we just saw that you were talking about sickle cell uh, patients uh, for mm-hmm. gene editing for Vertex. The patient volume is a lot larger than what we had for DLBCL, multiple myeloma, or for uh, DMD and other uh, therapeutics that have been approved thus far. So the economics is going to be uh, somewhat favorable on the demand side. Second, 
uh, reason I believe that this is going to change uh, in, in, in natural way is that the technologies, the technologies that Ori is developing and others, um, your peers and competitors in the industry are developing will help bring down the cogs uh, to manufacture these products and also allow at the same time to scale uh, the manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And together with those two, uh, I think uh, we will have the data given the patient volumes for payers to be able to look at uh, the evidence in a, with, a, with some more confidence and for manufacturers to bring down the cost of therapeutics in a manner that is more palatable and makes the business case very viable for everybody involved. The providers, uh, the payers and the manufacturers hmm. it, because it has to be viable for all three, right? not just for one entity. I guess the interesting thought process is, you know, what, what do we do about this challenge? How do we, um, one of the things that we argue for in the article that we published together was really an earlier focus on manufacturing. So we don't end up so far down the road where it's too late, you know, to, um, try and change anything, you know, with that kind of academic on process on steroids we've been using for preclinical development and probably clinical research. Um, if that goes too far down the track, that becomes essentially your commercial process. And then we end up in this catch 22 if we can't really change it, but it's not really cost effective. And so we're, we're trapped. Uh, and we saw that potentially happen with, you know, uh, some of the entrants that have come to Europe recently, um, with their gene therapies, Bluebird with Skysona and Zintegla, great clinical results. We're unable to get, uh, reimbursement, uh, in Europe, uh, for various reasons and are now making a go of it in the U.S. What would you advise either investors who are investing in therapeutic companies or the CTOs, CSOs, uh, CEOs of you know small biotech companies that are in those early phases, they're in preclinical development or just entering the clinic? What are the types of things that they should be thinking about to ensure that they don't end up in that dead end um, road where where some of the other other earlier uh, therapies have ended? Yeah. Now, Jason, that's a great question. And as you know, everybody working in this space is very smart. They understand the cost of delaying decisions, yet mm. they're making those, delaying those decisions. Mm -hmm. So you wonder why that is happening and what must change in order for them to start making decisions, the right decisions at the right time. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes down to how we measure progress and the metrics that influence people's behavior. I mean, because that's, if you want to change the behavior of individuals, you have to change how they're incentivized. Yes. And that's where uh, this comes down to is how are we measuring the success of early development that has been thus far has been in the traditional metrics. It has been the traditional timelines and the KPIs that we use, whether it's time to clinic, how quickly can we get the asset to clinic or how many yes. assets are we bringing to clinic that the walls and that you get rewarded for. Right. Mm -hmm. This reminds me of an analog that I wrote uh, several years ago now uh, when open innovation was a big idea and concept. Mm -hmm. And one of our clients, uh, and in fact, we ended up uh, doing the research together and writing about it in Nature and Drug Discovery in a peer review journal because the challenge was there too. The clients were, uh, early researchers were saying, you know, the industry, our, our own company and our own organization is challenging us on open innovation, they want to shut down the shop because they're saying we're not making enough progress in open innovation because they were measuring the open innovation with the same metrics that you would measure early research traditionally when a small molecular biologics, number of assets, number of, um, you know, uh, INDs and so on. And we had to change the whole measuring system for open innovation concept in order to people to appreciate that you cannot measure open innovation in the same manner as you as you measure indigenously developed assets and preclinical and filing to INDs. Similarly, here I feel investors and the people in, invest, interested in making people make the right decisions is to look very closely as to are we measuring, are we incentivizing for the right behaviors? The, the intent and the reality is very different because of what we measure. And therefore, I think what we need to change fundamentally is when we're developing the process earlier on and we're qualifying the opportunities in the preclinical stage, we have to ask ourselves, 
about the viability of that therapeutics from a development, from a from a uh, drugability, from a, uh, a pricing reimbursement very earlier on than we do today. Uh, and and measure on the robustness of process development rather than process how quickly are we getting and dosing the patient in the clinic. So we have to, what I call as developing to learn is a new way of thinking versus from developing to clinic. So we have to change that thinking altogether. Yes, obviously I agree with that point. I think the other learning or maybe this, the status of where we are is kind of the tale of two cities here. I know investors are starting to ask much, much earlier of those scientific founders and those spinouts, what's your manufacturing strategy? How do you get to market? What's your target you know, indication? What's, what line of, of treatment do you expect to be? What's the size of the patient population you, are you intending to address? And I think all those things are, are critical to get a hold, a hold of early in the R&D phase. But on the other side, though, to your point, I think the incentives for development teams are first in men. You know, get into the clinic as fast as possible. It used to be that those were your critical success factors and that those were the things that would lead to a potential buyout from big pharma is you had good clinical data. Now, you don't only only need good clinical data, you also need a strategy to get to market and a strategy to to commercialize and manufacture. It's now, it's not either or, it's both and. Uh, and I think a lot of the de- development teams out there are still focused on the former, but not at all on the latter. They're really focused on delivering those scientific proof points, but they're not at all uh, focused, or at least not early enough, on the manufacturing proof points uh, and how they actually deliver this product to the market. Uh, and you know, just recently we were talking to a leadership team, you know, very well funded um, cell therapy company in uh, focused on immune diseases, autoimmune, which, as you know, many of those indications are quite large uh, compared to some of the the cancer indications or rare disease indications we've been focused on before. And I said we're ha- we're head down trying to get into the clinic. That's like we don't want to talk about any of the other other stuff until we get uh, get those proof points. So you know the indications are well, the investors are saying these things, but are they actually when push comes to shove, are they incentivizing their teams, as you just said, to deliver a commercially viable product at the end of the clinical process? Uh, and I would argue that we haven't yet learned our lesson uh, on that. I think we're still focused on some of those, that old model uh, that, that has worked for 30 years, but we haven't really seen work in advanced therapies over the last five years. Now, Jason, you're uh, spot on. But I would also say, in, in fairness, you know, we didn't, the teams did not have an option. So, for example, I'll, I'll tell you another analog I'll, I'll talk about is the digital infrastructure that the treatment center portal, for instance, that everybody has been developing from the, from Novartis launch for cell chain to now the Janssen with the uh, sequence and all of that. So every provider now is dealing with multiple portals to order the therapeutics. And we knew this is going to be a problem. Even when I remember early days in the, in the school of thought was, you know, uh, we are going to uh, use that tool as a differentiator or we don't have an option. So we are going to go custom solutions. And now we have so many custom solutions. There was no option. That was the, one of the reasons. So now we have an option. So you know that Accenture just recently launched the universal solution. Now the industry has an option to mm-hmm. adopt a universal solution. So companies that uh, choose to do that, they can do it. Previously, there wasn't. That was one of the excuses that we just don't have. We have to go custom solution. There's no off the shelf. Similarly here, we it, the teams did not have an option to digitize earlier on. They didn't have Ori. They didn't have, uh, you know, Solaris or others. No. So they had to take the lab processes when they did the tech transfer and take that as something that they need to, to do to generate clinical data and they continue to work on. But now as you are developing and you will, you will be unveiling your technology and others are going to unveil the technology, the teams will have an option to adopt. And I think that would also uh, incentivize the teams to then take these digital assets earlier on and um, along with the support structure, with the incentive structure, I think there's this good hope and I truly believe that people will then adopt and we'll see what, 
in the next uh, 12 to 24 months, things change dramatically. There's certainly an interest. Um, you know, we, we see lots of interested, interested parties. We, as you know, um, presented some data at the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine meeting in October uh, which was very well received and generated a lot of inbound interest for therapy developers that are thinking about these challenges. Um, so I'm hopeful uh, as well that the trends that you foresee uh, are coming. Uh, but I do think, you know, human beings respond to incentives. We know how to drive behavior change and we need to make sure to align all those components. Just saying, hey, you guys need to think about your your uh, manufacturing strategy isn't isn't good enough. Uh, you need to really make sure that you know everyone is incentivized to deliver on what ultimately becomes a launchable, commercially viable, yeah. you know, product accessible product. And then, and then we give them the tools to use. Exactly. Then they will exactly. adapt the tools, and we'll be all. It's probably uh, not the field of dreams. If we build it, they will come. They need a bit of incentive and, and a map to get there as well. And I think we make an argument around um, potentially putting in rather than having every company have to reinvent the wheel themselves having this sense of having shared resources, potentially shared knowledge, shared resources, um, even shared technologies uh, that could help, uh, certainly, and investors who have a broad portfolio of, of therapeutics across lots of different maybe cell types or, or process types, uh, thinking about what we call infrastructure as a service. How can we um, invest once but get the benefit across larger portfolios and potentially that kind of financial incentive and, and you know, hopefully de-risking of the portfolio would be attractive uh, to investors. Um, maybe you can explain a little bit of this thinking uh, and its potential benefits for investors. Yes, I think uh, you're, you're right, Jason, and, and that's a brilliant idea because it's, on the surface, you can already see the synergies, right? If you, if you are able to standardize across your portfolio companies, there's going to be advantages. And our research and in our analysis, we've done that research already. And what we see is that if you were to take, you know, um, more than three, three portfolio companies, if you were to consolidate, you can see a uh, boost in profits and the three, three, three X almost and, and 25 to 50 percent, wow. um, back office cost reduction. Imagine with, with that kind of impact on business uh, on the, on the, on the, on your balance sheet. You, you have resources now available to focus on more strategic activities and, and acquiring the tools that you need and, uh, to be what we believe is twice the operational efficiencies that you can gain. That's incredible. Yeah. And I, I know we've seen some investors, at least on the, you know, maybe clean room or, or buildings infrastructure side, look at, you know, how do we provide some of our portfolio companies, you know, some of that kind of infrastructure. Um, I think, you know, Deerfield and Alexandria, who might have a bit more of a real estate background, have thought through some of that. But even the infrastructure that goes into the clean room, I think we're arguing to say, you know, thinking about digital solutions, thinking about automation and technical solutions like Ori's, thinking about other ways in which, you know, the if we'd not been having this conversation three or four years ago, we would have seen lots of therapy developers investing in their own manufacturing facility. You know, we need to put 50 to $100 million in the ground to control our destiny and control that asset. And I think we learned as an industry that that's hard, you know, especially if you're in preclinical development or you're in early stage, um, you know, this is a capacity utilization. You have, you spend a lot of money on that and running those facilities is expensive. We don't necessarily have the expertise and it doesn't make sense for us. What if we can switch to more of a service model, you know, and that's where I think we've seen a lot of CDMOs now come up and to support those early stage companies. Uh, but still they're all to your point, operating with the same tools, the same kind of Stone Age tools that we've been using for a long time. And we need the next set. We need the next set of infrastructure uh, and technical tools to really help this next phase of development happen and to get the economies of scale from that effort, you know, from that investment. Uh, and so I think that hits home, that strikes a chord with me and how some of the more sophisticated investors are thinking about this. Um, and is, is Accenture doing work? Uh, obviously it's a lot of what you do is confidential, but sort of broadly, I, I know that shared per portal launch that I saw a couple of weeks ago discussed is an example of supporting developers and investors and really using a shared resource. Are there other types of ideas that you and your team uh, have had or other things you're working on that might, might support this thesis being proved out? You know, we've seen, you know, big investments by people like Elevate Bio or Resilience where they're 
really supporting lots of developers um, using their own infrastructure. You know, they're investing in technology, they're investing in know-how, they're investing in digital systems. Uh, do you see more of that happening as we move forward? Yes, I, I think we see we see that. And Elevate Bio and Brazilian is a good example because um, Elevate has their own portfolio companies that they support mm -hmm. through the base camp. That's a great example of infrastructure as a service yes. concept. And yes, uh, we are we are um, working with investors such as uh, those, as well as others. You know, the, I also consider Biopharma as an investor because they also, we, we, it's just not the private equity or venture venture capitalists, but Biopharma invests in biotechs and also does do the acquisitions and try to manage those portfolio companies. Like for example, Bayer has multiple and so is Roche and others. How do they, so we also work with those bigger uh, Biopharma uh, trying to manage those uh, satellite companies and coming up with ways to provide the uh, common infrastructure that the biopharma has that the multiple of those satellite companies could use as an example and, and leverage the expertise, the in-house expertise of biopharma across their portfolio companies is a good example um, in the commercial space and as well as in the late stage development that we are helping. Uh, and in the biotech companies, we are doing, similar to what you are doing. We are help, we are advising clients to make the right investments in the right areas, mm -hmm. um, in digital capabilities to have the digital threat as early as possible to change that, uh, thinking. Current thinking is, Oh, I, I just need to manage two or three patients. Why do I need to, to invest in a uh, uh, digital? Now right. I could wait when the patient volume increases. But yes. we're trying to uh, work with clients where we say that every patient data matters. And uh, as early as you can get the digital uh, infrastructure, then it, it's very easy to, uh, for forward integration. Back integration is a lot harder, but forward mm -hmm. integration is a lot easier in this case. It is. And I think we've seen examples of that. I, I just uh, saw... Ying Huang, the CEO of Legend, present at Jeffrey's this past week, and you know he was talking about the deal that Legend and J and J as partners for Carvicti made with Novartis. Obviously, Novartis had some extra capacity in their manufacturing facility and and expertise in New Jersey, and they've sort of licensed that as you know essentially shared infrastructure now, so they don't have to build their own facility; they can license existing capacity, um, and that does work at the you know biopharma level as well as the investor level. But I think that thinking of the long lead times and the big expense of building those facilities or making those infrastructure investments uh, causes us, drives us to think differently or should be driving us to think differently as we look forward to how do we make these things more cost effective and more widely available. Um, so I, I do see that playing out more and more as we move forward. Uh, and they're doing that in addition to building out their own facilities uh, over here in the Netherlands, I think they've got a, two facilities they're building over here. So it's that kind of mixed approach that seems to be, uh, you know, part of the so the broader solution. Looking forward to to 2024, um, what are the things that have you either most excited or most worried uh, for CGT? I think there's a mix of, you know, I, uh, I talked to Tim Hunt yesterday from Arm, and you know, he was looking forward to several. There's a couple more approvals expected to happen even this year, in end of 2023. And then many expected next year as well, uh, which has got him excited. What's um, what's on your horizon for for 2024? Your wish list? What are you asking uh, Santa Claus for, or or, or whomever? <laughs> well, I think uh, you're right. We, we, on the bright side, we will continue to see approvals, which is great. Mm -hmm. But on the on the other hand, um, we will see. Uh, we will the uptake is going to lag, unfortunately, mm -hmm. yeah, even in 24, uh, at least until. Keep four or maybe until 25. And that worries me because I was just uh, at the biomanufacturing conference that I was there in San Diego last week. I met with a couple of CEOs, uh, both on the CDMO side as well as on uh, the biotechs. They are very worried. They're very mm -hmm. worried about the, the viability of this whole um, you know, modality. Yes. The, in the advanced therapeutics. They're saying, is it going to be, as you call it, uh, you know, relegated to a dustbin? Uh, and, and other than, you know, just being worthy of Nobel Prize, which it is, mm. but we don't want this to go into oblivion as an, as an, as an experiment, uh, but rather make it viable for the businesses who are trying to, you know, uh, enter the space and improve patient lives. That I think 
we will start to see some changes in 24, but I think 25 is, I feel, is the pivotal point when we will have uh, technologies coming from you, others, and uh, some of the changes that we were talking about earlier in terms of incentivizing. And it takes time to, to mm. make that kind of change. Uh, we're already in 24, you know, in one, one month away. Yes. So, so that I think 25 will be a better year for Cell and Gene. But in 24, what I will see is proof of concepts mm. of these new technologies. We already saw uh, BMS announce uh, the, the use of Solaris for uh, their, uh, for their uh, car T's. So that's very encouraging because that sets the stage to test the viability of these innovative technologies to bring the cogs down and to increase the scale. Uh, and that would then propel and galvanize others to start taking this uh, technology at their helm as early as possible. So yeah. that that will definitely happen in 24, I think, uh, the um, proof of concept. And, and I think um, if you can also share when Ori um, um, could also be uh, doing a proof of concept in 24 or when you are unveiling, mm -hmm. then I think that would help a very healthy debate on the technology and the adoption of the technology. Yeah, agreed. Uh, Sanjay, I'm not sure you got the memo. I'm the one asking the questions, not you. So I don't <laughs> want you to, uh, no fair putting me on the spot, but no, you're exactly right. We've been working with, uh, our friends at, at CTMC down in Houston, which as you know, is the joint venture between MD Anderson and National Resilience. So we've been actually develop, helping them develop in parallel their clinical process on the ORI platform. We should hopefully be presenting some, jointly presenting some data in May ish timeframe next year, just around the ISCT. Uh, meeting in Vancouver, um, and also kicking off um, with our big pharma partner, uh, some work in their labs sometime around that same you know Q2 uh, time frame. So I'd expect to see certainly in the second half uh, quite a lot of data coming out from our, the partner work we're doing currently. You know we've got four or five partners that are using the platform. Um, we'd love to be uh, in the clinic with one or two of them towards the end of next year or maybe beginning of 25 starting to demonstrate the clinical relevance of the products that are coming off the platform. And I think it's a very real um, uh, inflection point for the industry. It's a chance for us to say, actually, there's another way to do some of these things. And I, you know, I don't fault anyone, any of the pioneers for ending up where they have done because they've done the best with the tools they had available, you know. Uh, and so what our goal is to say, well, actually, the switching costs, the idea of taking some time and thinking about, okay, well, how do I redirect to a potentially a platform that can help me scale? That actually isn't lost time. Even if I invest, let's say, a year in that, you know, the, by our calculations, we could potentially save three years off the drug development timeline. So if you invest a year to switch over, potentially you're still net uh, in the green two years, you know, because of the tech transfer challenges and all the reproducibility um, and comparability challenges that that face the industry. So it is definitely something that I think it's a, it's a dialogue that needs to be had next year. And we need to be able to demonstrate clearly to the industry that this is a risk worth taking. Everything Doing anything but, but following the trail that everyone else has followed is, is seen as risky. But I think there's an opportunity for us to demonstrate there's an alternative path that can actually lead to the market more quickly and to lead to the market in a much larger scale, much more repeatable uh, process and much, you know, dramatically lower cost of goods. And all those things help, you know, go towards some of the solving some of the challenges that you and I have just been discussing. Yeah, that's exactly right, Jason. And that's, that's what I think in 24 will happen. These uh, proof of concepts, these um, experiments that, uh, that will happen. And I also agree that the, teams before before this, uh, they didn't have an option, as I was describing, yes. for the portals or the others. So they did what they, they needed to do in order to get these therapeutics to the to the patients. But now when you provide them with these options, uh, these uh, these technologies, then I think there's a reason for teams to adopt them. Exactly. And I think, you know, we've got some exciting, at least on the cell therapy side, some exciting pro um, companies bringing products to market. So I think iEvents uh, and Adapt Immune are both bringing the first TIL um, therapies to market. Uh, one is in a very large indication in melanoma, which has 100,000 or more patients a year, which uh, will be very difficult to achieve that level of scale. Certainly right now, I think Adapt Immune's product is in sarcoma, 
which has a high unmet need. You've got Autolus um, looking at ALL. So there's a new generation of products that are coming through. Um, and, you know, we'd love to be a part in, in trying to make those products a success. I mean, I think ultimately success is measured by how many patients we successfully treat, not how many INDs we file or how many patients we recruit into a clinical trial or, you know, that ultimately is the is the benchmark that matters. Uh, and so we're looking forward to working with those companies and also the next generation of, of therapy developers to make those fantastic products that they've developed available uh, for patients, which is really what we're all focused on in trying to get to. Um, I wanted to ask you a question specifically about what I, what I see to be as a, as a, an enabler to, to reaching those kinds of scales that we've been discussing. Um, and this is the, the digital layer, the, the kind of moving off of paper-based processes as we've been discussing. Um, you and I attended a, a workshop that already led at the end of uh, ARM a couple weeks ago to discuss this very topic. Um, and we've seen, certainly in the rest of our lives, let's just say outside of bioprocessing, everything's being digitized, right? We, we carry all the world's knowledge in our pocket on a day-to-day -to -day -to -day basis uh, in a mobile phone, but we're still batch releasing cell therapies on a, on a thousand page paper batch record, uh, because, you know, GMP requires us to do that. What do you think the future holds for us for CGT manufacturing? How important is digital in your perspective? It is one of those cans that tends to traditionally be kicked down the road, if you will. It's sort of like, oh, we'll, we'll tackle that later. We'll, that's a problem for tomorrow, not for today. Um, what, what would you argue, you know, what, what would be the proof points to say, well, this is something we should be thinking about now? Clearly, uh, you know, we've been saying all, all for the last 45 minutes or so this that need to adopt early. Now, how uh, that will happen and why that is happening uh, is going to be what we'll see. So, for example, you saw the new guidance that came from FDA mm -hmm. now in manufacturing. Even they are encouraging that, you know, start making any ma major manufacturing changes, not in clinical, but actually in preclinical. Yes. Right? And, and the reason is that... The later you do, the, the more expensive it gets uh, for you, for, for the investors and, and the developers to make changes to do that. So clearly there's a need. There is now, hopefully, with all the technologies that you and others are developing, we'll give the option for people to adopt early and with the support structure that we were discussing on the incentive, incentive structure so that we have different metrics to measure on. All of those, when come together, will adopt. Hmm. Now... When that digital threat happens, uh, what we'll see is the advantages, other than the ones that we talked about, is the experimentation. Because we, we these processes are um, it's very highly variable. Because mm -hmm. especially in autologous cell therapy, for instance, when every patient's cells are going to be different, and uh, so that's a variability on the on the on the raw material feeding into the process plus the the wild vectors and other uh, key ingredients that go into the manufacturing there causes the variability in the process. Now, to manage that more effectively, uh, you, you need the digital core hmm. to be able to collect the data in, in such that you can analyze and do the meta-analysis across your experiments quickly and much faster. So we'll see um, and the time to time up to reduction on a robust process development. Hmm. And when you have data, you know, there's a lot of, everybody's been talking about predictive AI and gen AI and all of that. As we know, you cannot do anything with that unless you have data. <laughs> and in a, in a structured and unstructured manner that is collected and stored to be able to train that data set to allow you to do that predictive analytics and to do the gen AI. And that's that's the other um, you know reason of what we will see when the digital core happens, the ability to then mine the data to be able to then uh, look at the stratification of your patients of your process, and to allow for um, the pricing reimbursement conversations, late stage development, uh, are more and more with a lot more confidence than we have today. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that last piece in because I think it's incredibly important. So usually when we're talking about digital, at this level we think about manufacturing, like GMP manufacturing, how do we create repeatable, reliable you know, processes. And that's absolutely critical, but there's so much that comes before that, before we even get a chance to, to go there. 
um, which is just development, you know, development at, you know, multiple runs and multiple sites. And there's this, you know, shorthand in the industry that says, well, development really, really begins when you get into the clinic because then you start to see patients starting material and all the variability and challenge that patient cells bring. Um, and this, you know, maybe more so than some of the other biopharma use cases out there for, you know, predictive analytics for uh, machine learning uh, algorithms to really try and divine what is happening in our processes because you've got variable inputs going into a standard process uh, and we need to better understand that. We need to better understand it. We need to better characterize it. And to your point, unless you capture the data and you capture it in a structured way in a digital, you know, the data lake or wherever your data resides, you've got no chance. I mean, literally, you've got no hope. If you've got, a, if all you've got is a paper batch record uh, and lab notebooks uh, where where data is written in, you're stuffed. I mean, it's just it's an impossibility. And so this is when you see very high failure rates in some of these processes. You see the regulator querying. You know, why did we see that outcome? You know, what was the root cause of that? We often say we don't know. We're not, we're not really sure. Um, but when we start to get, you know, hundreds of runs and then thousands of runs, and then you start to be able to divine, well, what's actually happening here? Uh, and that could shorten development times dramatically. That could, you know, by having those, that knowledge in house, you could start your process out, you know, 50% optimized. You don't have to start at 0%. You can start at 50% and 60%. And that, you know, for me generates much, much more quickly value for investors. Uh, and for you know, founding teams to say, actually, we didn't waste two or three or four years trying to figure out what the heck was going on in our process. We sort of knew those things coming in because we had the analytics to to yeah. um, really see deeply into those you know R and D runs and those preclinical runs to understand what was happening in our processes. Um, but right now, it just it's impossible without this digital underpinning, without these data, without these databases, without these systems that talk to each other. You know, I sat on a panel a couple, I don't know, maybe a month or two ago, and it was about Industry 4.0 and how the CGT, <laughs> CGT industry gets to Industry 4.0. And I'm like, I think we're maybe at 2.0 if we're lucky. We've got a ways to go. Uh, we've got a ways to go. And um, again, it's sort of, it's too easy to kick this can down the road and say, well, it works for our two or three patients or our 10 patient clinical trial to to do this on paper. Um, but we need to make it easy. We need to make it easy for them to say, actually, I can be digital from day one. You know, I'd, I'd flip the switch or turn the key and it, and, it, and it goes. And another thing to add to that, Jason, that you said is the tech transfer. Because I mean, when you have the process and you, when you're going towards late stage, your network uh, strategy, the manufacturing network strategy and the partners that you're going to use right now to onboard a CDMO, to onboard a, a new site, the tech transfer alone is very time consuming, very it expensive. Takes forever. Yeah, six to nine months if you're lucky, you maybe a year. It. Yeah. So to have that digital uh, recipe, to have the digital process, you can replicate and do the tech transfer very, very fast and quickly. So your time to market, the time to onboard your new capacity is incredibly fast. You're lucky in today's world if you only waste a year, two years on, on tech transfer. <laughs> I mean, that, that would be a good outcome. And we can, you know, we've been tech transferring client processes onto our technology in a month and then starting to run their process and already outperforming what they were doing in the kind of analog world, you know, with the old, you know, first generation tools. So it just shows you, you know, if you can save six or nine months at each tech transfer step, then that, you know, adds up uh, in that kind of broader time frame. Um, well, Sanjay, thanks so much for, for spending some time with us today. I had one final question, if you don't mind. Um, just to say, if you wouldn't mind just trying to see, you know, look out five to 10 years from your perspective, what does good look like for the industry? What do you think uh, when we, when we get back together five years from now on, on this podcast, you and I, what, what will we be talking about then? What is the successes we will have had and, and what are the challenges that remain? I think everything that, the, that we discussed today uh, in terms of the challenges on manufacturing scale, adoption of digital I see five to 10 years of plenty of time for that. The headline would be that cell and gene therapy now can be treat patients, tens and thousands of patients every year, not just for one or one or two therapeutic area for rare diseases, but for chronic diseases and can impact, you know, the, the society overall. Because right now it's a very niche space and it's struggling. But when we meet again, I think 
we we will be behind some of these problems will be behind us i agree and i think as an extension of that i would say you know not only accessibility or approval at first or second line but accessibility you know so it can be approved clinically for the use there but not getting used there because of other factors i think having the ability to bring these things first or second line we know that the proof points are there. The clinical efficacy is there. I don't think anyone's going to argue that these products shouldn't be used earlier in treatment. Uh, but if they can get routinely used earlier in, in therapy, I think the, the clinical benefits that we'll see will, you know, there's an exponential uh, opportunity for us because obviously we're, we're fighting against last line therapy, very sick patients, you know, probably compromised T cells and trying to build these products. Um, there's a virtuous cycle to be had in moving them earlier, you know, more effective therapeutics, better clinical outcomes, um, if we can address some of these other more systemic issues around accessibility. So I hope, I'm hopeful for a, uh, a future sooner, sooner rather than later, definitely within the five year time horizon, uh, where we're seeing these new interventions that are incredibly powerful, uh, used much earlier, uh, on patients and, and seeing the, the clinical benefits from them. Jason, uh, I, I can say that uh, with good level of confidence because anybody that I speak to, whether they're in the life sciences uh, sector or or in the CDMO or wholesaler sector, is that they're committed. They want to do, make this work because they see tremendous promise for the patients uh, with these modalities that are, like I said, incredibly clinically efficacious. We just, mm. So they are not moving away from this. They are committed. And, yes. and we'll work with all of us together to bring that reality in five, within five years. Agreed. And I, I think we'll, I'd like to close with just one more thought to say um, we need to ensure not only affordability in relation to other cell therapies or other gene therapies. We're seeing lots of innovation happen across the biopharma industry, including in ADCs and other you know, immunotherapies and other types of treatments. Uh, as well. I, I, unfortunately, we aren't special in cell therapy. We can charge, because we're cell therapies, we can charge half a million dollars a patient. I think it's really looking at a broad accessibility across a suite of interventions to ensure affordability and accessibility. And that's why even more so, um, you know, that those types of products that aren't, don't require, that aren't personalized, that don't require the same supply chain that cell therapies do, uh, they have that benefit. They have the benefit of, you know, 30 or 40 years of infrastructure and learnings around the development of biologics or, or whatever their core, um, core technology is. Uh, we need to think differently. We need to think differently early in order to make sure that this, this incredible intervention has a chance to reach, reach to patients and, and have that impact. Uh, cause ultimately, um, as we said, every patient who has an opportunity to, benefit from this, you know, deserve, deserve that, that opportunity. And unfortunately not everyone does, you know, only about 3% of the patients these days or have that opportunity globally to access these therapies and the ability. That's why we do this. That's why, you know, these companies are investing billions of dollars and bringing these products to market. Ultimately we don't want to fall short of our goal, which is, you know, wide accessibility. And, and that's what gets you out of bed in the morning. And that's what gets us out of bed in the morning. Yeah. And that's why I became life sciences consultant. I was able to close the circle from mm -hmm. academia to managing consulting to bring life saving drugs to patients. And we are one or two degrees of freedom away. That's what's the most exciting part too. Yes. I do feel like, as you said, 2024 could be a very interesting kind of transition point between the old methods and the new and a chance for us to really change the slope of the curve, which is very exciting. Well, Sanjay, on that positive note, I'll just thank you so much again for spending time with us this, today and, and uh, look forward to seeing you again, uh, hopefully maybe after the holidays when uh, conference season starts up again. You'll be probably in Miami, I, bet, I guess, in, in January and or San Francisco. So I hope to see you in, in one or both locations. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jason, for having me. Very uh, insightful talk, conversation. Uh, and uh, there's more to discuss and we'll continue to talk about this. Look forward to it.